this presentation is for people that think that vegetables are good and meat is bad. So if you know somebody who thinks that way, then you can send them this uh, these series of slides. The first thing we need to do is talk about research. And once you understand research, then you can come to conclusions. There's so much misinformation about diets. 98% of what you hear is wrong about eating food. So before we start into that, I got to give you my diet history. My name is Dr. Darren Schmidt. I'm a chiropractor focusing on nutrition since 1993. And my here's my diet history. I've been low carb since 1999, less than 75 grams of carbohydrates a day. And if I ever cheated on that, I would go, I would still be below 125 grams of carbs per day. In 2015, I started ketosis, cycling in and out of ketosis. In 2018, August, I started the carnivore diet. And the first year of the carnivore diet, I had one rule and that is eat as much meat as I possibly can every day. And it was fantastic. And I put on some weight that, and that was my goal. And I was in ketosis every day. In year two and after that, eat as much meat as I need or want for the day. So I put on weight, like I said, but then my clothes were too tight. So then I dropped down about six or so pounds and I've been staying at the same weight ever since. And I'm happy with that. My energy is good. Brain works good. Emotions are stable. And meat is the uh, basis of the human diet. I spoke twice to the USDA Dietary Guidelines Committee to convince them to only look at science for the 2020 food pyramid update. They have to update that every five years. I failed at that. They did not look at science. In the bottom right corner of these slides is a red box. That's for a video presentation that I gave recently. So here's science. There's levels of evidence. There's seven. The bottom is expert opinion. And so one person has an opinion based on experience or knowledge or clinical experience, for example. Level six, one above, is single, descriptive, or qualitative study. And there's no science there. It's just a, a description. The next one up is a systemic review of descriptive and qualitative studies. And that includes observational studies, too, um, also known as epidemiology. Again, no science there. There's no experiment. Level four is the case control or cohort study. Cohort just means group. So you're testing or surveying one group. And with, with real science, you need two groups minimum. One is a control group and the other one is the experimental group. So again, level three or level four, there's no um, science there. Now, level three is a controlled trial without randomization. And what that means is you have a group of people in a clinic and you do something to these people. And the control group would be the rest of the people in the clinic that are not participating in that trial. And they're not randomized. Um, you could have some people with similar genetics or similar lifestyle choices or different, but it's not intentionally um, randomized. Okay, the next one up is one or more randomized controlled trials. Now, this is where you take a, a different people in, and put them in a group, and they have ge different genetics and different lifestyle habits, et cetera, and you're testing one thing in the experimental group versus the control group. And then level one is a systemic review and meta-analysis of the randomized controlled trials, and then you can get clinical guidelines based on these reviews also known as a meta-analysis. So levels two and one, the, I'm sorry, levels three, two, and one are science because you have an experimental group and you do something to them. Now levels four, five, six, seven are not science. They're the beginning of science. And I'm gonna go over this in more detail so you fully understand. This is a pyramid showing what I just described. At the bottom, you have editorials, expert opinions. Above that, you have case reports. Above that, you have case controlled studies and then co cohort studies. Again, cohort means group. You're looking at one group. There's no um, science there. There's no experiment done in a group of people then compared to the control group. And then at the very top of the pyramid, we have the uh, upper two echelons. You got randomized control trials and systemic reviews. So this is somebody else's graphic describing what is science. When you see the cohort studies and below, those green ones, yellow, orange, those, that is not science. It's the beginning of science. And those give you really good, or maybe sometimes very poor hypotheses, also known as educated guesses. Here's another um, author uh, creating a graphic with a pyramid. And at the very top, we have randomized control trials. And above that, you could say a, a meta analyses of randomized control trials. And to the right, it says, it is shown that. You can state a fact. It is shown that, um, Walking on grass makes your shoes muddy. And you know that because you experiment, you did an experiment with a group of people and you had a control group and it's a fact. So below that you have controlled longitudinal studies. Again, that is not science. It's, um, it's a survey, it's an observational uh, study over a period of time. And it says, it is likely that on the right, it says it is likely that. So you can't say it's a fact. You can say probably, 
and then and then below that uncontrolled longitudinal studies cross-sectional studies and case studies those you can get the statement there are signs that there are signs that when you walk on mud your shoes will stay clean you know like there's no fact there it's just a hypothesis and then at the very bottom expert opinion and i'm not degrading expert opinions in these studies from these studies you move them up the pyramid to the top and then you actually do science then you get a fact so if you have one person who's an expert and he's got an opinion or she great keep moving that opinion up the ladder or up this pyramid to the top so on the left it says studies reviewed by the iarc that's a note uh, depicting that the international association of research on cancer um, convinced the World Health Organization that can't, uh, meat is a class two carcinogen, but they didn't look at any science to come up with that conclusion. Those two arrows show you that they looked at uncontrolled longitudinal studies and cross-sectional studies and case studies. So when you hear a anti-meat advocate say that meat is a class two carcinogen, know that that's wrong. Know that it's based on opinion and survey. It's not based on any science. And this is the graphic that um, illustrates that. Okay, so surveys are not science. There needs to be an experiment where you do something to a group of people to cross the threshold from survey to science. So the lower parts of that pyramid is survey, the upper part is science. Okay, so here's some examples. These survey studies are not science. Cohort, longitudinal, cross-sectional, case study, case series, case control studies, observational studies, epidemiology, exploratory epidemiology. So those are all just fancy words describing different kinds of uh, surveys. Okay, next slide on the same subject, surveys are not science. These studies are science, controlled clinical trial, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial, systemic review of only controlled trials. And that's it. There's no more other types of science. Now, I'm really specific, specifically talking about nutrition. 95% um, or more of nutrition research is not science. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Another slide, surveys are not science. Here's some specific examples of surveys that are not science. Blue zones, there's books written on this. This guy has an empire, a financial empire based on his um, ex exploratory epidemiology known as the blue zones. The China study, it's very famous, but it's been debunked left and right. There's no science there. It's a survey, big survey. The EPIC study, NHANES. NHANES is the nutrition uh, survey that the United States federal government has been funding since the 70s or something. And the Dietary Guidelines Committee that changes the uh, the food pyramid, they rely on NHANES like it's like it's their um, pacifier or their baby blanket. Like that, that's their go-to. It's not science. The Okinawan study, that was post-World War II, and they people said, oh, look, Okinawans live a long time. They don't eat meat. Well, post-World War II, that island was devastated and all the pigs were killed. So yeah, they didn't have meat because they were killed in the war. Now, here are some studies that are science. They're well done in a clinic, controlled. Okay, the Minnesota coronary study, this is a multi-clinic study, and they gave people vegetable oils versus animal fats, and the people with vegetable oils died sooner. They had more heart attacks and more cancer. So vegetable oils are bad. Animal food, animal fats are good. The Verda Health Study, a two-year keto study, uh, shows that keto the ketogenic diet is the best for weight loss, the best for diabetes, than any other diet ever studied. The Women's Health Initiative, they took a group of women, and they said, reduce your meat intake by 20%, and they followed them for years, and they compared that group with the uh, control uh, control group, and there was not a decrease in cancer for the women that dropped their meat intake. They did not get 20% sicker because they dropped their meat intake. They, there was no change in their health. And uh, low carb beats low fat 36 to zero in randomized control trials. And this reference below is the Public Health Collaboration of the UK, phcuk.org. And they're looking at the best of the best clinical trials on low fat uh, diets versus low carb. And low, low carb beats low fat 36 to zero. And the last bullet point here, there are 1,910 low carb clinical trials. All are ignored by the USDA Dietary Guidelines Committee. The people on that guidelines committee, they are wrapped up in money. They're funded by the food manufacturers and the food manufacturers make big bucks. They have huge profit margins when they put together vegetable oils, salt, sugar, and refined grains, and they feed it to you thinking that it's food. That is not food. It's super uh, toxic and deadly and malnourishing. And that's why our food pyramid is basically upside down. Okay, so how do you um, pinpoint an unethical um, diet expert or maybe a, a journalist or reporter? They say things about diet and it sounds real smart, but it's not. This is what they often claim. The unethical diet experts often claim you need to look at the totality or preponderance of the science. 
And what that means is that all the science is equal. So you look at all of it together. And from that, then you come to a conclusion. Well, like I said earlier, 95% of nutrition research is a survey and it's not science. So when you look at 95% nutrition research telling you that meat is bad and that um, vegetable oils are good because that's what surveys do and there's a reason why, um, then you come up with the wrong answers and that's why 91% of American men are overweight because of unethical diet experts saying that they know the science. So when you're on PubMed and you click on the upper left corner, you can weed out the nine science. So I have a little example there. You click on clinical trial and randomized control trial on the bottom left of this slide. And that gets rid of all the junk and you're left with real science. Unethical diet experts may also claim something like this. Eating five almonds a day makes you live 11 years longer. I've heard this kind of thing uh, about different plant foods and it's not plausible. It's just not true. But what they do with the surveys that they come, come up with is they put these answers on Excel spreadsheets and they move the answers around and they do some math and they do various things and they think they're doing science on the Excel spreadsheet, but they're not, they're just moving data around. Then they come up with these ridiculous statements like eating five almonds a day makes you live 11 years longer. Here's another comment. A single nutritional chemical causes disease and such as TMAO or LDL. And that's not plausible. So I, just looking at one chemical in the body, there's so many buffers and barriers and explanations and physiology and biochemical reactions that there's not one single nutritional chemical that causes disease. It just is not plausible. The Harvard School of Public Health Diet Survey is valid. This is what unethical diet experts may claim. That Harvard School of Public Health Diet Survey is not scientifically valid. It's been tested a few times and people will underreport their calories or overreport their calories. The questions are poorly worded and they'll do this survey once every five years. And let's say, how many cups of spare ribs do you eat per year? Who's got an answer for that? So that's a ridiculous statement. And this survey was created by Walter Willett, and he's still the head of this um, public health school. And he wrote a book, it's very pro-vegan, anti-meat, and he's basing all that on surveys. So um, also too, with this survey, they'll, they'll collect the data. And let's say they have like 5,000 people. All I gotta do is hit send on by email, send it to all these people, it's really cheap. They fill it out, some of them respond back. And then when they do another assessment of their health, let's say five years later, Sometimes they just keep the same data on their diet from five years earlier, as if the people had not changed their diet or something. So there's just a lot of like unethical behavior and incomplete, incompetent behavior. And that rules nutrition, by the way, that kind of behavior just, it rules the industry, the profession, it's really sad. So at the bottom bullet point, the American Heart Association, American Medical Association, USDA, the American Dietetics Association, which has a new name now, but they all say a plant-based diet is op optimal. And it's not, that's an appeal to authority. And can it be that all of those um, groups and associations are wrong? Absolutely, 100%, just because they're government funded, uh, just because they read the same studies, just because they have PhDs or masters or whatever, can they all be wrong? Yes, 100% wrong when they, see, when they say meat is bad and you need a high fiber diet, you need a high carbohydrate diet, you need to reduce your animal protein and reduce your animal fat. All those statements, 100% wrong. And don't claim that, oh, because, because the government says it, it must be right. No, that's an appeal to authority. Or you could say, well, my favorite nutritionist on YouTube, he's really smart. And he's always right. Nope, that's another appeal to authority. Another thing, I'm a chiropractor. So people say, well, you're only a chiropractor. That's, again, another appeal to authority. So what? My license doesn't really matter because I study the hell of the subject. And I'm giving you this information so that you can be as smart as me in this material. And then you can um, demonstrate the fact that you know the difference between a survey and science, and then you can come up with really good um, facts. Okay, moving forward, what is the scientific process? Okay, this is what a, an opinion has to do to become a fact. Okay, so science is not a paper. People say, oh, I got this paper showing blah, blah, blah. Okay, it's not just a paper. It's not a series of, it, it, it is a series of steps. All steps must be followed. This is key. The next four slides are different examples of the scientific process. So, this circle here at the very top, it says observation. And so somebody says, oh, look, there's mud on the, on the ground. And they have a question. If I walk on the mud, does my, do my shoes get dirty? And then the hypothesis is, yes. I think that based on my experience and my knowledge and just looking with my eyes, I think that my shoes will get dirty. Then you do an experiment. And the experiment is where you do something. You have to do the thing. 
and then you walk on the muddy ground and you analyze your shoes and you come to a conclusion. Yes, walking on mud makes my shoes dirty. There And the experiment is the key right there to prove that your hypothesis is correct or not. Okay, here's another way to say that. This is another graphic, another author. And you can see from the top, identify the problem, gather data, hypothesis, and then test the hypothesis with the experiment. So this shows that this is the scientific process. And next one, another one, you start at the very bottom, ask a question, do some background research, come up with a hypothesis, and then again, test the hypothesis by doing the experiment, analyze the data, at the very top, draw the conclusion, and then report the results. Now, when you report the results, that allows other clinics around the world to replicate your experiment and hopefully come up with the same results. That's another part of the scientific experiment. Okay, now this one, it claims to be the scientific process, but it's not because nowhere in here does it say do an experiment. It says come up with a hypothesis, collect data, and does the data reject the hypothesis, yes or no? Okay, so guide to reading certain, now, now that I've bashed survey studies, let's look at how to read them. And then once we know how to read it, I'm gonna give you a collective of, of uh, survey studies and I'll show you those conclusions. All right, when you're reading a survey study, observational, epidemiological, or whatever, at the very top bullet point, it says RR equals relative risk, OR means odds ratio, HR means hazard ratio. So just for the sake of simplicity, think of all those as being the same. And what it is, it's a collection of uh, data and then you come up with a number. So if the number is one, then that thing that you're testing is neither harmful nor beneficial. So if you think that chewing gum, for example, will prevent toenail fungus, that's your hypothesis, and you do a survey, you do an observational study. If the number ends up being one, that means that chewing gum does not cause nor does it prevent uh, toenail fungus. Okay, now if the number is less than one, it means that chewing gum prevents toenail fungus. And if the number is greater than one, it might mean that the uh, chewing gum causes, or uh, yeah, causes toenail fungus. Now, if it's greater than one, it can't just be like 1.05 or 1.1 or 1.2. It's got to be three, like 3.0, 4.0, 10.0. Okay, so that's important. So once you have an observational study with a relative risk of four, then you can send that, then you're thinking, well, maybe I should send it up to other researchers who have more money, more manpower, and they can do an actual experiment. They'll get 100 people chewing gum every day for five years, and 100 people not chewing gum for five years. And then you can see if chewing gum causes toenail fungus that way. That's the experiment. Okay, now the bottom bullet point says cigarettes have a relative risk of over 100. Okay, now compare that with, you know, various types of meat, for example, would be 1.15, right? So that's not good enough data to say that meat causes any harm. Okay, now here is a big um, collection of serve, uh, observational studies on a variety of foods to the left, wine, tomatoes, tea, sugar, salt, potato, pork, onions, olive milk, blah, blah, blah. So there's plants in there, there's drinks, there's meat. And then the question is, does eating plants affect cancer? And the answer is no, because the relative risk of all these studies combined is 0.998. It's basically one. So eating plants, eating uh, other foods and meats, does it cause cancer? No. Does it protect you from cancer? No. According to all these studies, all these PhDs, all these, how many hundreds of thousands of people, maybe, I don't know how many people are in these studies collectively. This was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition in 2012. So bear with me on what uh, you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. So what causes cancer? Bear with me. Okay, does protein intake affect cancer and heart disease? Because some people say, well, eating animal fat or animal protein is bad. It's, and the answer is no. Protein, whether it's from plant or animal source, does not cause cancer or heart disease. It, does, it doesn't affect it in any way. It doesn't prevent it, it doesn't cause it. So the relative risk for cancer is 0.98. And the relative risk for heart disease is 0.99. So again, this is a big collection of many observational studies. And the, and the reading, um, the references right there, BMJ, British Medical Journal. So you can have protein, animal, or plant, doesn't matter. You can have a variety of foods, and it doesn't cause um, cancers. Does red meat cause cancer or heart disease? Okay, so we talked about protein. What about just red meat as a specific food? Now we're not talking about um, 
um, observational studies here, these, 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 are, these are actual scientific clinical experiments and a meta-analysis of them? And the answer is no. So the effect of lower versus higher red meat intake on cardiometabolic and cancer outcomes, a systemic review of randomized trials, only randomized trials. There are zero scientific experiments that show meat causes any disease. So when somebody says red meat causes disease, cancer, or heart disease, no, it does not. It never did ever in the history of humanity. Red meat never, ever caused any disease, period. So let's get back to the earlier question. So if eating plants and meat and other foods does not cause heart disease, nor does it cause uh, cancer, then what is it? Well, my theory is that it's a lack of ketosis. Basically, using sugar as fuel throughout your whole life for decades, and you can have a clean diet, and you can have um, relatively good blood glucose for you know 80 years but then you get cancer because you never got any ketosis. That's my working theory. And having studied um, nutrition going back 150, 200 years, that's what I think is missing. This is Dr. Georgia Ede, and I'm, I'm such a big fan of her. She's a psychiatrist at Harvard. She actually works at the student clinic. So we're gonna get into that in a second, but this is about a two minute video, two and a half minute video. And what she did, she goes on PubMed and she looks up vegetables and health, trying to find out if vegetables are good for human bodies. Here we go. Just as an experiment, I wanted to, to get a feel for what kinds of evidence is out there supporting vegetables and health. And so what I did was I went on PubMed, and which is a search engine for those of you who don't know, the scientific particles. And um, uh, there are over 80,000 studies about vegetables, so I obviously couldn't go through all of those. Uh, narrowed them down to, the, to uh, randomized control studies having to do with vegetables and health. And I use the word health because if anything, that might induce a positive bias. It's looking for evidence to support vegetables. And so unfortunately, most of these studies I, I had to eliminate uh, from, from the consideration because most of them were irrelevant to the question. The vast majority of studies about vegetables were about how to get people to eat more of them, not about whether or not they were actually healthy. So, and of the studies that remained, 18 of them were negative. The investigators were looking for health benefits from vegetables and didn't find what they were hoping to see. And as you might notice here, uh, the, another problem with vegetable studies is that the vast majority of vegetable studies are not studies of vegetables. They're studies of fruits and vegetables. The fruits and vegetables are very different uh, from a plant point of view and from our point of view. They're, they're just completely different features. So hard to say. So in the positive studies, I found 10 positive studies, but unfortunately, none of them controlled for refined carbohydrates. It's very hard to say whether or not the health benefits that the investigators claimed were due to the vegetables were due to the vegetables or whether they were due to the fact that the people who were eating more fruits and vegetables were eating less refined carbohydrate. And 10 other positive studies, unfortunately, manipulated more than one variable. So they didn't just add more vegetables to people's diets. They also happened to reduce sodium or reduce saturated fat or um, add exercise, et cetera. So it's just hard to tell which part of the diet was or, or the intervention was responsible for the health benefit. I'm not saying that the vegetables couldn't have been responsible because they could have been. We just can't tell because of the way the studies were designed. So this video is from 2012 showing that there are zero scientific studies that prove that vegetables are good for us. Now, I emailed Dr. E last month and I said, hey, have you ever done another follow-up on that kind of search? And she did. And she sent me the results. When she did the updated uh, search, that was 2017. Again, zero scientific studies that show that vegetables are good for us. So now we're talking six years later. And do we have new studies since 2017 where somebody actually just studied vegetables and health and they did a clinical trial with an experiment? I don't know. Um, maybe you know. And if you do, send it to me. In the meantime, I'm staking the claim that there are zero scientific studies that show that vegetables are good for us. There's also zero scientific studies that show that meat is bad for us. Now, one more thing about Dr. Georgia Ede. She's being a psychiatrist at the student clinic at Harvard. Picture this, you got a 20 year old Harvard student and they walk in, they're depressed and they send her to the psychiatrist. So Dr. Ede sees this patient and says, what are you eating? And they go over the diet. And then Dr. Georgia says, okay, you need to eat some red meat probably every day, eat red meat every day. And then they get better and they're not crying anymore and they don't need uh, psychotropic drugs anymore. And she did the study, 31 inpatients, 100% of them got better. 100% of these, of these people got better. And 43% had clinical remission of their diagnosis. And these are people, there were 12 of them that had bipolar, 
six had major depression, 10 had schizophrenia. And um, they went on a ketogenic diet, 75 to 80% fat, 15 to 20% protein, 5% carbohydrates. And that was appropriate for them because we're talking primarily students. They're still young. The brain isn't fully developed until the age of 25. These people needed to eat fat. And all the nutritionists, all the mess halls, they're, everybody's saying fat is bad, do a low fat diet. And that makes people sick mentally and physically too. All right, let's talk about this guy, Dr. John Yodidis. I'm gonna say it again, Yonides is how you say his last name. Medical doctor, meta researcher. He says nutritional epidemiology is a scandal. It should just go to the waste bin. So Yonides compares randomized control trials versus epidemiology. And I've studied his work. I've read several articles from him. He's just absolutely brilliant. He studies the studies and he also studies the science. And he looks at the science of all the different professions. So material science, space exploration science, um, biomedical research, economics research and science and pharmacy and you name it, all, the, all of them. And he looks at the quality of them and finds pokes holes in their, in their weaknesses. But regarding, there's two factors regarding nutrition science. Number one is finding the truth. Number two is finding the disease. So in order to find the truth, you have, a, you have to have a high quality study and that's a randomized control trial. And the chance of you finding the truth with a randomized control trial is one to one which is 100%, or two to one, which is 200%. Imagine playing the lottery and you have a 200% chance of winning the lottery. So you'll win the lottery and get double the money, right? Like that's the chance of finding truth. And that's depending on the type of randomized control trial. It's fantastic. But epidemiology has a chance of finding truth one in 10, all the way down to one in a thousand. So epidemiology is garbage. That's why John says it goes in the waste bin. All right, so finding the disease. This uh, statistic is called PPV, which stands for positive predictive value. And you want that to be greater than 0.5. And so a quality randomized control trial has a PPV of 0.85, but epidemiology only has a PPV of 0.2 down to 0.0015. So it's mathematical that epidemiology is garbage. It's not just opinion. It's not just the horrible clinical results. It's not that everybody in the United States is getting cancer, heart disease, and being overweight because of the food pyramid. It's not, you know, it's, it's also mathematical that you need to avoid um, interpreting epidemiology as if it's science. So here's some hazard ratios for heart disease. So now I'm, I'm getting back to survey type studies and I'm looking at that, remember that number one, if the number is one, then it's neutral. And if it's less than one, it's protective. And if it's greater than one, then it's detrimental. So what might possibly cause heart disease? Well, at the very top of this list, we have type 2 diabetes. Does that cause heart disease? Probably very likely, yes. And in a collection of observational studies, the hazard ratio for type 2 diabetes causing heart disease is 10.2. So what causes type 2 diabetes? Sugar and seed oils. Now, just below that, insulin resistance, hazard ratio, 6.4. Metabolic syndrome, 6.0. Hypertension, 4.5. Obesity, 4.3. All of those are caused by sugar and seed oils. So you can see the pattern here that sugar and seed oils cause all these diseases. And then the, re the reverse of that then is ketosis. Okay, and then smoking is in, down, toward, it's down towards the bottom at 3.9. And then triglycerides are only at 1.8. So an LDL is only at 1.3. So like I said earlier, it's, the hazard ratio has to be like three or four to consider it to be something to consider as a cause. And then you send it to a um, cl clinical trial. Let's talk about this like quality of plants. Why are pesticides not banned? Because the poisons made by the plants are 10,000 times more abundant by weight than the poison sprayed. So the government agencies were looking at the um, sprays that farmers are using on their plants and the government agency said, well, yeah, those sprays are bad and they're bad by this much, but the plants already have poisons in them and those poisons are bad by this much, a lot more. So if people are gonna eat plants, who cares that there's a little bit of Roundup on there or some 2,4-D or atrazine, who cares? Because the plants have so much more toxicity, 10,000 times more by weight. So 99.99% by weight of the pesticides consumed by the American public are made by the plants themselves as a defense mechanism, and that's by Dr. Bruce Ames. And these toxins are 
uh, called phytates, oxalates, cyanide, tannins, salicylates, lectins, nutrient blockers, hormone disruptors, and solanine, which is the main ingredient in nightshades. Brussels sprouts have 136 known poisons. So a couple references at the bottom there. So let's talk about when you're eating food and you're finally coming to a conclusion of, okay, I'm going to eat meat, maybe some iceberg lettuce, some fruit. Fruit is better than vegetables and fruit can uh, be beneficial. Um, the three macronutrients, you got protein and that maintains the structure of the body. You got fats and carbs and those are fuel. Those are energy. The other, there are more macronutrients. Alcohol is one, ketones are another. Alcohol is the worst one and ketones are actually part of fat. So you can gain fat on a keto high fat diet. So I did that in 2019. I wanted to put on weight, but stay in ketosis. So I just ate as much meat as I possibly could for the year. And it was fantastic. I could put on mostly muscle, but my, my clothes got too small. So I had to uh, lose, lose weight to, so I didn't have to buy a new wardrobe, but the proteinpercent.com slide is this one. I love this website, proteinpercent.com. And so when you look at this graph on the left, there's a, there's a blue arrow or purple arrow at the very bottom. And, you know, as that arrow goes up, the red part, it says fat gain. The blue part is maintenance. And then the green part is um, protein, fat loss. So the more protein you eat and the less energy you eat, you gain uh, muscle and you lose fat. But the more uh, energy that you eat and less protein, then you gain fat and you lose muscle. So at the very bottom, there are uh, there's a pile of white sugar and refined flour and then a seed oil a bottle of seed oils and that's what junk food is it's all energy no protein at the very top of that graphic there's a white powder that's whey protein and then egg whites and that's what bodybuilders do they do all protein no energy that's how they get their body fat down to nine percent for example and then somewhere in the middle you got you know there's ground beef there's steaks there's eggs there's um turkey and bison so where do you want to go? Do you want to gain muscle and lose fat? Go up to the green. If you want to lose muscle and gain fat, you go down to the red. That's how you do it. It's very mathematical. And on the right, I have a quote, sports nutrition is human nutrition, Tim Noakes. So he said this to me once and I was like, I was talking to him about physiology. I figured out lactic acidosis at the time and how um, athletes get it temporarily. But when people are sick, they get it permanently. And we need to reverse lactic acidosis. That's the mechanism of chronic disease. And he totally agreed with me. And he didn't know, he didn't know what to say. He didn't know how to follow it up because nobody talks to him like that. And uh, he goes, yeah, sports nutrition is human nutrition. I was like, boom, exactly. So if you want to look more like a bodybuilder, not that you have to look weird, but you just want to be lean and have nice muscles, go to the green. You don't have to be weird about it. <laughs> okay, some comments from me. These are, these are some of the learnings that I've had over the years. Our native diet and native state. Okay, our native diet is obligate carnivore. There's a guy named Dr. Anthony Chaffee. He said that on his YouTube channel recently. I like that, that comment a lot. Our native metabolic state is fasted and in ketosis. And you don't want to stay in there forever. You got to obviously eat food. And you want, you want to come out of ketosis too. So that's where fruit comes in. And you can do that once a week. You can do that once a month. It's up to you. Our most nutritious foods are liver and red meat. Liver's at the top. Red meat's at uh, number two. White meat is number three. And you want to eat pounds of meat a day. If you weigh if you weigh 100 pounds, then eat a pound of meat a day. If you weigh 300 pounds, uh, you might be eating four or five pounds of meat a day. I'm at 180, and I eat over a pound a day. And in 2019, I was eating about three pounds a day. Our prim our primary digestive hormone is glucagon, and insulin is for emergencies. So if you don't know how glucagon functions, you can look that up and read it. You need everybody talks about insulin resistance. They talk about insulin diseases. Insulin's a problem, but what's the solution? The solution is the opposite. It's glucagon. It's ketosis. It's low carb. So instead of being experts in insulin, we need to have experts in glucagon and how to make that work. There's no po there's no pre post workout foods. There's no snacking. Just meals followed by many hours of fasting. So. In the sports nutrition uh, sugar industry and electrolyte industry, they talk about pre and post workout foods. No, no, no. You, you're eating your regular diet, you're eating regular meals, and they're meat heavy. And then you, then you can fast for 10 hours or five hours or what, and you can perform doing yard work really well. And you can perform at the computer and have good brain power for hours on end really well. So that's, that's basically how the diet, when you have the good diet, you don't need to eat three meals a day. 
and you can you can you can still do that but you don't need the three meals a day and this is how food is your medicine your diet is a daily experiment for the rest of your life so people say well food is medicine right yeah exactly and this slide right here is your medicine it's how you eat your food meat is food plants are medicine plants are chemicals when you eat garlic you're trying to get the allicin and the other chemical that's in garlic when you're eating echinacea you know you're getting those uh, chemicals when you're eating you know name a plant and you're using that plant as medicine and you're using your meat as food keep that in mind so like uh, you know spinach like that has is so high in oxalates not everybody can digest that i mean i can but you know what i'm just not gonna I'm not interested so when you're eating something like spinach you're eating something so you know some plant-based food or you're drinking something you're not eating meat that's the problem right so once you get your diet down you still have to experiment uh, day after day for years and then you'll know like you're you're okay with some foods and 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 not so i'll have iceberg lettuce sometimes and then i eat fruit sometimes to come out of ketosis but these are things that you need to experiment with and you might need you, st you still might need 30 percent plants and 70 percent of your calories from meat but you got to figure this out on your own so now you have a scientific foundation about meat versus plants and from there um, have fun good luck keep studying keep experimenting with your diet know that meat is food and plants are medicine and the more meat you eat the more human you become uh, addictions go away um, emotions get under control pain goes away chronic illness goes away you're reversing your chances for getting heart disease and cancer the more meat that you eat and the, my favorite statement here is that the more meat you eat the more human you become and i came up with that at having recommended a meat-based diet you know for 20 years now students become smarter um, hormones get happier and emotions become under control when you have somebody eating a lot of sugar they go nuts they end up with candida in their body chronic infections they end up with all kinds of autoimmune conditions and mental problems eating junk food they got pop in the schools and then their behavior goes haywire they get mentally ill they get diagnosed with bipolar or manic depression and it gets scary and then there's all these like gun problems and it's it's they end up on psychiatric drugs and read the black box label on psychiatric drugs and see what those drugs cause and it all starts with the diet so when somebody's eating sugar and bad food, junk food, they're not nourished with meat, they get these mental problems, brain problems, they go see a psychiatrist and it only gets worse and worse and worse year after year after year. There was a time when there was uh, school shootings and in the news, they would say that that person was seeing a psychiatrist and they stopped that maybe around, I wanna say like 2011. And they said that nobody needs to know this, whether or not they're seeing a psychiatrist because that's you know, pr patient privacy. But wait a minute, that person just shot up a building of people. And we need to know why. And if you don't tell us if that person is seeing psychiatrists, then that's detrimental to all of society. In the meantime, people are blaming the parents, the, the teachers, they're blaming YouTube, they're blaming video games. They, there's no known cause because there are secrets being held. And those black box warnings on psychiatric drugs say, increased suicidal and homicidal tendencies and ideations. It says it. It shows you the psychiatric stranglehold that they have on our culture. It's like 25% or more of Americans are taking psychiatric drugs. And the psychiatrist never said, what are, what's your diet like? Just like Georgia Ede in her clinical trial there, uh, 31 patients, they all got better. 100% of them got better. And 28 of them had serious psychiatric diagnoses. If any of these conditions rang true for you and you need some help, then call my office. You can be a patient. You can see me or one of my other practitioners.